Well, it's our last week. Eight weeks of hell have sped by. Eight weeks of hacking around vineyards, handling hangovers, eating foie gras, truffles, and drinking some of the world's most famous wines. And I thought, to celebrate this, our last programme, we'll go out in style with what some would say is the world's most wonderful wine. Cheers. Oh, my God, that's dreadful. <laughs> Hey, JP, what's this stuff? I thought we were finishing in style on this programme. Yeah, you try it. It's awful. Well, I thought you'd be interested, because this is actually the base wine for champagne. If that's champagne, I am Inspector Clouseau. Mm. Street is a bit acid, isn't it? It's appalling. Anyway, we better see how they turn this into something drinkable. My liver, my liver. Clearly, you've gathered we're in the heart of champagne in the golden triangle between Rance, Epernay, and chalon sur marne where we'll be tasting and talking about the wine and its history, and how the bubbles get put into the bottle. By the way, I hope you've got yours ready for our final tasting. This is the most northerly wine region of France, right on the limit of suitable grape-growing conditions, where, year after year, the harvest hovers close to failure and yet somehow manages to ripen just in time. There are many fascinating aspects to Champagne, a different set of rules that set this particular wine apart from the rest. Moet, Boulanger, Rouge, Tatanger, all names famed for producing the world's most celebrated wine. Ah, oh, JP, a lyrical setting for our last tasting in this series, but it is Champagne we're tasting, so I hope you've got your Champagne Brut at the ready and start to uncork now, because we must get on with this. Racing drivers always make a mess of this. I think it's a shame. I mean, not that I'm a great lover of champagne, but just to whack it up and down and squirt it over people is a ridiculous waste of money and totally disrespectful. And they should never be allowed to come off with a great big bang, by the way. The softer the plop, the more successful the opening is, because you should be able to pour it more easily without the bubbles flowing over everything. Isn't that so, that's, Master? That's right, that's right. A fut rather than a plop. Yeah. Not bad. Right, here we are, my dear. Is there any real difference, essentially, in tasting sparkling champagne to tasting ordinary wine? Not, not drastically. The first thing you can see, we're using a slightly different type of glass, that sort of it's tall... a small one. It's a very small one. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Compared to some of the uh, glasses you've been using. No, but you see, the important thing is it's a flute-shaped glass, um, and that gives us those lovely long streamers of bubbles. Right. People back at home should be conscious that... Um, the glasses have to be absolutely clean to get a nice, neat, you know, a nice sort of what's called the mousse, the fizz. Right. So, clean glasses and Got a nice there. flute shape. Clean glasses. Get the old man out there polishing them at once. Okay. So, the first thing, as ever, we look at the appearance, and you can see it's clear and bright. And as I say, what we need to comment on is this amount of fizz, the mousse of the wine. And you look for a good amount of fizz, and generally, the smaller the bubble, generally, the better the champagne. That one looks pretty good to me. Yep. We can say it's got a good mousse. Anyway, so on to the smell. As usual, you can see it smells nice and clean and fresh. Um, there's a sort of fruit character there and, you know, reasonable intensity. But the extra thing always to look for on a champagne is the smell of the yeast. We're going to see in the production process. The wine spends time maturing on the yeast. And it's often described as giving the wine a sort of bready, almost sort of doughy character. I don't know if you get any of that. Nope. No. Do you get a, <laughs> get a bread flavour out of this? I don't. I'll take your word for you it. You take my word. Yeah. <laughs> this is the yeastiness. Actually, something else I heard, some space cadet was telling me that you're meant to also listen to champagne. I mean, um, and let the bubbles talk to you. Um. Yeah, it's saying, drink me, drink me, and get on with it, Jonathan. <laughs> you didn't really do that at home, did you? You didn't, honest, put a glass up to it and listen to it. Oh, well. So on to the taste. Now, we're going to see later on, most champagne is made in a virtually dry style, as you can taste there. But remember, we're in a very cool part of France here, so you can taste very high acidity. Yes, but it's not disagreeable. I, I mean, I, I think I rather quite like this, actually, because oh. it's not over-fizzy. Uh, and incidentally, it's not too cold. No, nope, it's not over-chilled. And you can see it's quite light-bodied, very clean. Um, but as you say, very, very pleasant. Um, 
wine, really. What, what, what is the difference between this and sparkling wine? I think what we'll see is that the actual production process, what's called the traditional method of getting the fizz into the bottle, these guys invented it in Champagne, but it's used elsewhere in the world. Um, the difference is going to be in the vineyards, as usual, with the soils and, as I was saying, the climate. So that's really the, the crunch difference. Mm. So it's that base wine you're tasting that is actually different from any other base wine for sparkling wine. Actually, this is quite smooth. I mean, if that's not a contradiction in terms for a, for a fizzy wine. No, no, it's very pleasant. As soon as I can drag JP away from his I Spy book of grapes, I've got a couple of questions to put to him. Because earlier in the series, he categorically said white wine was made from white grapes and red wine was made from black grapes. Now he's trying to say that they make champagne out of black grapes. Ah, Jonathan, thank you. You should have learned all this before you came, <laughs> by the way. He's obsessed with it, obsessed. Well, I can show you why very easily. I mean, here's a black grape. If you squeeze a black grape gently, you can actually see that the juice that comes out actually has no colour at all. Ah, right, and so the skins are discarded for Absolutely. the champagne making. Absolutely, that's how they do it. And in fact, what we're going to find in the Champagne region, they actually grow three different types of grape, two of which are black. The two black ones are Pinot Noir, an old friend from Burgundy and elsewhere. Um, the other one's a bit of an oddity, it's called Pinot Meunier, only really grows in the Champagne area. And then, of course, we've got our old friend Chardonnay, again from further south. So it's actually almost always in Champagne a three-way blend. And they reckon that each grape contributes something to the blend. So they reckon the Pinot Noir gives you the sort of body and the structure. The Pinot Meunier matures quite quickly and gives you a sort of instant fruitiness. And then, of course, like you, dear boy, the Chardonnay contributes finesse and elegance to the blend. Mm -hmm. Fine. Now, the other thing is, many people think that Champagne is a white wine and it's infused with something to make it fizz. But what actually happens? How is it really made? Well, it's actually a very, very fascinating process. But for that, Eugene, you need to go down to the cellar. Bonjour. I have to tell you, JP, there are two things that leave me bored witless. Having to look at somebody else's kitchen and tramping around dank wine cellars, galleries full of bottles. But I mean, come on, I mean, if you're going to be dragged around somewhere, look at this. I mean, this apparently was dug out by the Romans. And down here, they've got two million bottles of champagne um, in some three kilometers of caves. But in fact, that's just a drop in the ocean. You know, if you look at the whole champagne industry, apparently they've got 900 million bottles stashed away underground. 900 million bottles? 900 million bottles. That's incredible. A week or two to drink that. How long does that take to drink, actually? Well, in fact, it's only roughly about uh, three years' worth of stock. So we're drinking a lot of champagne, you know? And spending a lot of money. Yeah. I wouldn't mind being a champagne merchant. Well, my dear old thing, if you're going to become a champagne baron, you better know how it's made, hadn't you? Um, you start. <laughs> Well, I mean, they start off with that very acid white wine that we tasted earlier, and they put some sugar and yeast into that and stick it in the bottle and then bring it down into the caves here, and the wine undergoes a second fermentation actually in the bottle, and that produces the carbon dioxide and turns the wine fizzy. But, in fact, that's almost only half the story because at the end of the fermentation, what happens is the yeast die away. In fact, if you look at this bottle, can you see there's a whacking great sediment of yeast there. Yeah, yeah. Now, the yeast, when they finish working, die away. You yeah. see, and they form a, a very sort of heavy, sticky sediment. And they start to digest themselves. And in fact, much of the flavor the of cannibals. champagne... The cannibals. The cannibals, <laughs> yes, that's right. But they actually release flavor into the wine. And so, if you remember earlier, you know, when we were tasting the champagne and we had that strong yeastiness, it actually comes from this sediment. And in fact, even a non-vintage champagne, the basic stuff, has to mature for at least 15 months on the yeast to get the flavour. And how do you, I mean, do you filter the yeast out at the end of the day, or does it self-destruct itself? So one of the clever tricks in champagne that we'll look at in a moment is how they actually get the sediment out of the bottle. And it, in fact, just around the corner, we can see how they, they do that. This is fascinating. What happened is that the widow Clico is meant to have taken her kitchen table, drilled holes in it, and to get rid of the yeast, what she figured out was that if she loaded the bottles in horizontally to start with, by twisting the bottle a little bit each day, and then gradually, over a period of several days, coming back each day and twisting it a bit more, the yeast that we saw earlier would run down the inside of the bottle. So by the time we get to this stage, hopefully we've got a plug of yeast on the neck here. And then, to actually get rid of the yeast, they stick the neck of the bottle into freezing salt water, and they actually freeze the neck. So you can almost imagine like a plug of ice here. And of course, the trick there is you can then turn the bottle upright. 
and the yeast stays packed with the ice and it's all fired out, yeast and ice. You've got the same pressure in here as a bus tire. So, so just by fine. taking off the top, yes. that little frozen bit will shoot out. Shoot out. And in fact, in the old days when Widow Clico was around, I don't think they even froze the neck. It would just literally, they would have grabbed the bottle like this with the yeast and then whacked it off. Yeah. And then, of course, as I say, all they need to do is top up, replace the bit of wine that they've lost. Um, but at, one of the weird cheats of champagne is they actually add a bit of sugar to the topping up wine. So that sweetens it up a bit. So uh, champagne gets away with quite a few things. And as you know, you're normally not allowed to sweeten by adding sugar. And then just before shipping it, they'll usually let it rest for a while. Bottled, corked, and ready to take away. Yeah, that was brilliant. And thanks for everything, really and truly. Thanks a lot. Hey, Roy. Yeah? Oh, yes, of course. One for JP. <laughs> Two names have helped put the House of Boulanger where we are today on the map. One was the legendary Madame Boulanger herself, and the other, of course, was the mythical James Bond. But, JP, the question we need to know the answer of is, who actually invented or discovered champagne? Well, I think it's like many of these inventions. It's actually a bit of a mistake. I hope you're paying attention to all of this. <laughs> Back in the uh, 17th century, you know, Louis XIV, wild living king in sort of Versailles, he drank champagne, but what he was drinking was a red wine. Was it fizzy? Well, this is the odd thing. It's actually a still wine. And apparently the story goes that one particular cask or batch arrived in London um, and then started to ferment again. And so obviously the wretched stuff started to go fizzy. And of course, you know what the Brits are like. Some loon thought this was a good idea and actually got into the fashion of drinking a fizzy wine. And then the sort of focus of attention came back to France and to this monk. You've probably heard this chap, Dom Perignon. And I've drunk him several times. <laughs> I've drunk his product. But he's the guy who's meant to have sussed out the idea of blending the three different grapes together was actually better than using just one. And he also is meant to have perfected the business of doing the fermentation actually in the bottle rather than in a cask, you know? Right, so what's that got to do with Newcastle Brown? Which, by the way, I think you ought to have a, <laughs> a swig of because I'm on the champers myself. <laughs> this is the injustice of this world, isn't it? Hey, boy. A perfectly decent brew. Look at the head on that. Yeah. No, apparently what happened was that the old Dom had some real problems because his bottles were exploding and he couldn't get any glass that was tough enough to resist the pressure until he found that some Geordies were actually making glass that was strong enough um, you know, to actually resist all that pressure. So uh, that's Newcastle's role in the invention of uh, champagne. Well done, Newcastle. Um, so it's not a marketing ploy, then, to some of us think of having these heavy bottles just to look posh? No, absolutely not. It's literally the heavyweight bottle is to resist the pressure, as is the big pump there, so it makes a strong bottle. I'll drink to that. Anyway, back to business. I'm sure the director said something about see you in the boozer. The boozer? Boozy, that's what he meant. This must be it. Champagne, as a wine-growing region, is unique in France. It's the only region that doesn't have an identifiable cuisine, unlike Burgundy, which has its coco van, like Alsace, which has its choucroute, for example. So I'm free, free to cook what I want. And after eight weeks on the road, I've decided to be outrageously extravagant. I'm going to stew a duck in champagne. Have a look at this. A wonderful corn-fed duck, a bottle of champagne, some fresh leeks, little baby turnips, shallots, garlic, fresh peas, lardons, lettuce, and herbs. OK. But, and that, by the way, is just simmering over there in my little wood oven, my feu de bois oven over there. Now, I also need to warn you that the thing I'm going to cook next could upset sensitive people and vegetarians. This is murder, OK? Never mind. It is a bowl of very expensive crayfish, which I had helicoptered down from Rungi Market in Paris this morning, landed just over there. Truffles costing more than cocaine, saffron costing more than truffles, and then boring little things like shallots, garlic, and parsley, and some very expensive Marc de Champagne. And, of course, some champagne. So, the first thing to do, sling some onions into there, sling some garlic into there. So, crayfish, sorry about you squeamish ones. These little chaps are alive. They have to be alive to maintain the correct culinary philosophy and gastronomic reality of France. Jean-Francois, who is probably the youngest champagne grower in the whole of Champagne, gave me some of his 50-year-old grandfather's 
made by his grandfather, Eau de Vie de Marc de Champagne. And that is going to go in there, quite a lot of it. And then... We're going to flame all those in Eau de Vie de Marc. This will release flavours from the onions and from the garlic and, of course, from the crayfish. Notice how they're changing colour very rapidly. Right, we'll let that simmer away for 10 or 15 minutes until the sauce reduces right down. Now, while that's happening, and while Master of Wine, Jonathan Pedley, is somewhere in the vineyards missing this wonderful treat, I want to tell you about one of my favourite wines. It's called Boozy Rouge. It's pure Pinot Noir. This is a 1990 vintage. It's made by my friend Jean-Francois here. And I'm not going to do all those funny things about looking at rims and colours and depths and twirlings and things. You just fill up a very large glass like that. And you think to yourself, where would we be without masters of wine to lead us down the slippery, slopey paths of happiness? And from my advice, Boozy Rouge or Cumier, which is another red champagne wine, should be drunk slightly chilled. And you can quaff it. You can taste the Pinot Noir, and you can even hear Pedley saying, I want some, I want some, but he's in the supermarket or looking at some vines. Anyway, enough of all of that. These are ready. They've got to come out. The ecrevis, the crayfish, have to come out onto my platter. This, by the way, is a meal that you really do eat with your fingers, because it's not a refined meal in the eating process, but it's a refined meal in the tasting process. Now, you can see the sauce, which is of champagne, and a little fish stock is quite well reduced. We'll add a little bit of saffron into that. Now, actually, I have to be totally honest. Back up to me, please, Mike. That is not saffron. It's food colouring. But I couldn't get any saffron, but I wanted to show you what it would look like if you could put the saffron in it. So I always like to be relatively honest on these things. Then we're going to add some double cream. Like that. And whisk that in to the wonderful champagne and fish stock sauce. And then we're going to add some truffles. Unfortunately, the director has discovered I've been overspending on this shoot and would only allow me to buy 20 quid's worth of truffles. Ideally, you want to put about 60 quid's worth of truffles in. Right, I must get my duck cooked in champagne dish back out over here. Have a little look at that. I think you'll find that's an agreeable little snack. And then we just pour that over that lot. All right. And we'll drink two happiness, food, gastronomy, art, history, culture, and of course, champagne, albeit a red one. Get all that? Good. Now it's back to the bubbles and JP. We're eight weeks down the track and you're still dragging me through vineyards. What's so interesting about this? Quite frankly, I'm up to here with vineyards. <laughs> well, let's hope you're not up to here with what's in this vineyard, because if you look at this soil, um, it's not actually proper soil at all. Can you see it's actually minced up sort of domestic um, bin bag garbage? It's quite frightening. Look at this. You mean it's been put here deliberately? Yeah, I mean, who's going to try and grow wine on a metal coil? Well, evidently, you're mad chums, are <laughs> But no, apparently this is, the, if you like, a sort of semi-organic fertiliser that they've used until fairly recently. There's nothing organic about dustbin sacks, mate. Well, I think the sack and the plastic doesn't degrade, but everything else rots down. And combined with the chalk rock underneath everything, that's essentially what champagne grows on. So let's just get this straight. Champagne is the result of an accidental birth. It's made from three different grapes, and if that doesn't quite work out, they can add some more wine and some more sugar. It's grown on barren soil, enhanced with household garbage. Why is it so expensive? Well, I guess the short answer to that is that we'll all pay for it, or some of us will pay for it. 
But in terms of production costs, you've got to remember, first of all, Champagne is the coolest vineyard area in France, so it costs a lot to grow the grapes. We've got, as you say, this vile soil, which is obviously only going to give a low yield. And then, of course, down in the cellar, the stuff has to mature for a long time. And then, of course, there's a lot of money goes into marketing the stuff. So when you add that all together, you end up with quite an expensive price. But I think the bottom line you need to remember is that to get the best grapes in Champagne area, it costs about five pounds a bottle. So you're starting with an expensive raw material, you know. JP, we have six different champagnes, six different labels. Pray unravel the mysteries. OK, now the way it works, you can see these five bottles all have the word Brut somewhere on the label. So they're very dry. Very dry. The odd man out on the end here is the demi-sec, and this is where they've added a bit more sugar at the topping up to make it a slightly sweeter start. Now, at this end, we've got the regular non-vintage champagne, which is the sort of bread and butter of the champagne industry. It's a selection of wines from the current year, plus some older reserve wines to smooth out variations from one year to the next. The cheapest one. Yeah, that's right. In a really good year, they'll select some of their better vats and their best barrels. That's blended. No reserve wine is added. And as you can see, it carries the vintage date there. And then occasionally, in really stonking years, they'll make, if you like, a creme de la creme selection, the very best vats. And that what's called prestige cuvee wine gets put into a sort of fancy bottle like this. Very good, very good. And then a couple of other variations on a theme. If you add a bit of red wine during the blending, you'll end up with the rosé champagne. If, when you do the blend, you only use one grape, in this case, Chardonnay, you can see it says that on the label, it's often also labelled as Blanc de Blanc, so it's just a one And this, grape. again, is an expensive one, a good one. Yeah, that's right. Because it's a small production, they charge a bit more for it. And this stuff, the curse of all weddings? Yes, this is just, as I say, where they've added a bit more sugar in the demi-sec to get the sweetness. Uh, I quite like it, it's not so bad. Peasant. <laughs> well, there we are. We've uncorked champagne along with the Burgundy, Alsace, Provence, and wherever else we went. I've forgotten already. It's all become a bit of a blur.